Always My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Scarlet flows out of neon, stains the summer night that ebbs from Broadway, and time is on the run. And far down the street, a woman who for a moment stops to lean her head against the far crest of night, lets spray of summer lamplight brush against her hair, walks on, and the nighttime on her shoulders. So gather the small coin, run to the phone booth, place the call, make the bid on what's left of warming dark, and drum the wall, and remember that other summers were spent in a similar phone booth. And then the throat that croons, no answer, and the click, and the return of coin. So go home. You've made a dime. And where I was, and Detective Mugovan, black slick of river, and jot of pier into it, and slow dance of garlands of colored light against hulks of river shapes. And a man newly gathered from the gleaming waters, man beaten, man unconscious, man in time interval and small space that precedes dying. Nothing, Danny. No identity, Mugman. No cards, no wallet. said nothing, no... which means nothing. Except the bruises where he was beaten on his throat, around his head. Gash on his head, maybe from when he was thrown in the river. Hit one of the pilings, maybe. Talk to the man who pulled him out? Yeah, I talked to him. Well? Well, Mugman? Is... The man, uh, Charlie Downs, his name was. Charlie said uh, he was taking a little late walk down by the river. He was back there, uh, that alley there, hmm. when he saw the fight on this pier. Two guys fighting real quiet, real hard, Charlie said. Then one guy threw this other guy into the river and ran away. Charlie jumped in and saved this man. Charlie says he don't need a medal. Says whatever we think is fair will be all right with Charlie. You'll talk to Charlie some more, huh, Mike? I will. Because I like Charlie. That's cool by the river, isn't it, Danny? From nearby, from the street that edged the waterfront... Light and convertible in a summer night. And the instant is made up of that, and the match struck and touched to Detective Mugovan's cigarette, and mechanical moan, and men waiting at the scene of violence in its publication upon the small winds of night. Violence now in the hands of those job rated by the community. Doctor, photographer, measurer. So leave there. Go home. Try to sleep. And it's only really the humidity which keeps you awake. But another July day comes around, another moist working day, and Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. You know what Mrs. Tartaglia said to me two minutes into my farewell to her this morning? I don't have any idea, Gino. She said to me, no matter how hot it is today, think cool thoughts, Gino, and tell Danny. So I'm telling you. Oh, thank Mrs. T for me. Danny? Yeah? What kind of cool thoughts? Gino, have you got anything for me? Like sliding on ice? So help me, Gino. It's... Charlie Downs, the man who jumped into the ocean and saved his fellow man last night, has been released as a mere stroller who was happily upon the scene. He was happy for the opportunity. Thank you, Gino. Go on. The man who he pulled out has been identified. Oh? By recognition, more than by science. Uh, Gino... Dr. Sinsky, being an old fight fan, recognized him. And then so did some of the other fight lovers who happened to be... Who was the man who was pulled out of the river, Gino? Harry Bryan. The name ring anything? A bell or a... I'm not sure. Well, perhaps this will help it ring, Danny. Harry Bryan beat a man to death with his fists in the ring last year. Here. An account from the newspapers of the fight. Killed a boy named Tommy Cullen. You're doing very well, Gino. Would you say cool? All right. Uh, what else have you got? Well, not too much more, Danny. Address of the brother of the boy who Brian killed, if that'll do you any good. And? And what? Notes and comments. Notes and comments my own. May I? Of course. I searched the good Nat Fleischer's book on the matter, and records show that after killing a fighter in the ring last year, Harry Bryan's career has zoomed downward at a pace which can only be described Thank as... Thank you, Gino. Is that all? The... Indeed. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Come on in. I... I saw you drive up in the car. I'm John Sealak. Harry Bryan live here? That's okay. Don't worry. Just sit and wait if you want. For whom? Yeah, that's a question. All right. This day and age, you never... Mind if I ask you who you are? John Sealak. This is where Harry Bryan lives, isn't it? What do you think I'm doing here if it isn't? What are you to Harry Bryan, Mr. Sealak? A relative? A friend? A what? Uh, look at it one way. Both, you'd say. I book fights. Some of Harry's. That's all you cops know that promoters do, book. I'm his friend and... That's fine. You understand, don't you? Not just a guy. I, I said and... that's fine. You're a friend. You want to help and you want to answer questions. You bet. You bet I do. Who would try to kill Harry Bryan? You're not kidding. Who would want to kill a sweet guy like Harry? You? Oh, mister. Mister, mister, mister. You haven't told me yet what you're doing here, Mr. Selak. What you're doing, waiting for her. Who? For her, for Marva. Who's Marva? You kidding? Well, who is she? Harry's wife. Came over to see whether I could do anything. She said, yeah, you can. Can I borrow your car? I gave her the keys. I'm waiting for her to come back with my car. How can you refuse anything after you've eaten the papers her husband gets beaten, thrown away in the ocean, and such a sweet guy? Promoted him a few charity bouts at the arena, so we got to know each other. You run in tomorrow. Tell her I'm waiting for my car. Hello there, fella. You Russ Cullen? This morning you tried, you couldn't say a wrong thing to me. Uh-huh, I'm Russ. And you're a cop, huh, fella? That's right. I took off from work special so as I could meet up with a cop. You want to come in, fella? Yes, Mr. Cullen. Yes, Mr. Cullen. Now, ain't that a kick? You want to come in? Come on in. Eh, see how clean and neat my everything? Because I knew you were coming. Took off from work and cleaned house just because you knew the police... Yeah, were... mm-hmm, fella... Happy day, oh, happy day. Because you know Harry Bryan is dying. You touched the crux, fella. You really did. The real crux. Deep. <laughs> is that enjoyable, huh, Mr. Cullen? Yeah, it's okay, fella. You can edge into the happy time. Let's celebrate the clobbering of a louse, Harry Bryan. Other men have been killed in the ring, not only your brother. Uh-huh. Other men, but not like my brother, not like Tommy Cullen. That's why you beat up Harry Bryan, huh? Threw him into the river. Wanted him dead. Listen, you. I'm listening. You want to hear about my brother, about how Tommy Cullen got killed? They just want to cry from the mouth. All right, tell me. A Harlem Legion Hall. Club fight a year ago, March 8, 1952. My brother, my brother Tommy Cullen, matched in a semi-wind-up with Harry Bryan. My brother was just a punk, a club tramp, but with moxie. Tommy Cullen, my brother, had a heart this big. He... Go on. He's dead, my brother. A whole year, four months dead. You care he's dead that long? You were going to tell me about the fight, how... You ever seen Harry Bryan in the ring? No. Dirty. Vicious. Elbows, head butts, rabbit punches, everything in the dirty book. Killer boy, that's Harry Bryan. Cut and hook for blood. Cut and hook and jab for blood, that's Harry Bryan. That's what he did to my brother... Had Tommy flat five times in one round, then the bell. Next round, Brian carried my brother, waltzed him, whispered in his ear, held him up. Next round, he killed Tommy, beat my brother's brains in. Doc said that's what happened to Tommy Cullen. His brains got beaten in, from which he died. A year and four months for you to wait, and last night you got to Harry Bryan for your brother. Last night, I was, take your choice, movie, bar, street, the gutter, any of those places I could have been. Take your choice. Any of them says I didn't touch Harry. You'll stick close, huh, Russ, just in case... Oh, I... you flip fella? I'm not going to be out of town when Harry Bryan dies. I'm going to be right here, real close. Bye for now, fella. Good, huh, honey boy? Harry? Danny, quiet. Way I'm rubbing your shoulder. Feels nice, doesn't it, Harry? His wife, Danny. His wife, Marva. She has to sit with him at his hospital bed. She said she knew what to say to him so he wouldn't die. What about him, Dr. Sinsky? How is... Whatever words she knows, Danny, they will not... Harry? Harry, honey. Loosen up, honey. Your back and shoulders are... Doctor. Yes, Mrs. Bryant? Harry's dead. I felt it. 
I felt it when he died. Mrs. Bryant, I am Don't say deeply... anything, Doctor. Just do what you do for the dead. What I was trying to say to you, Mrs. Bryan, I am deeply sorry. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. An evening in July starts at the river before it closes over Broadway, and the heat of it drowses along the darkening street. Now and then a breeze, bloated with dampness, slides along him against the granite, picks a man waiting for a bus and wraps him in moisture. And skyward, the setting sun strikes a million glints that flicker and pale and coalesce and become a shadow. It's a sodden time, the handkerchief under the collar time. The man at the box office screams about 20 degrees cooler inside. It's a twilight's dying on Broadway, but it's Broadway, and that's the reason you're here. And above it and east, in a corridor constructed for exits and entrances upon pain and compassion, hallway designed simply so as not to intrude upon tears or laughter, where I was, and a woman, newly a widow. Everything was done for him that could be done, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Oh, I'm sure that... How do you know? You're not a doctor. You're a cop. You're a... What are you going to be to me now? What are you talking about? A large hand, gently on the shoulder and say, be brave. I don't need you. Who needs you? Not me. Oh, listen, uh, Now what? That's up to you. I can take you home now or talk to you now. Talk to me. Go ahead, talk to me. Who killed your husband? Chit-chat to be addressed to Widow Brian. So young to be a widow... Shame about her husband hit over the head and dumped. Let's ask her who did that to her husband. Come on, I'll take you home. Come on. No. You'll want to know about Harry. About my husband, Harry. How he was there one day when I went to a fight. How he was there up there in the ring, in the corner. And at his feet, a man. The boy he killed. No, that was later. First night I saw Harry, he knocked out an old bum in the first minute of the first round. And suddenly, I swear it was just like this. He looked out over the faces at me. And later, after the fight, I waited for him, and he came over to me, took my arm. It was an hour before we said hello to each other. You don't believe that, do you? Well, perhaps that's not important. You see, no. I... You see, that's the thing that's more important than anything. Because after he killed that boy, it stopped being that way. Somehow, what happened destroyed Harry, too, as if he was the one that had been killed. I see. And... Nothing was all right after that. Harry would take beatings in the ring, beatings after beatings. What made me love Harry? His strength? Dead? You threw him over, son. No! I tried. I tried and tried. I was his wife. And I... I helped him. I... I tried to help him. I tried... brief interval of July, then, set aside for summer lament and weeping. The woman removes her hat, removes amber combs from her hair, cascade of hair to shoulders, then face raised to sunlight, and the hair pushed in a fan from the back of her throat. Face stilled to sunlight, eyes closed, and stillness. And tears are dried in summer sun. Will you take me home now, please, Mr. Clark? And take her home. And the threshold be thanked, be touched on coat lapel, be dismissed. Uptown and west and north again to 104th Street and Stewart's gym. And the men outside leaning against its facade and interrupt the drone of their summer talk. And one of them tells you quietly that he is Mr. Stewart who runs this place. And once when he first knew Harry, Harry was a good boy, unimaginative but good. And somewhere between Patterson, New Jersey and Madison Square Garden, Harry had picked up a little imagination and turned cute and dirty and killer, which was good for percentages in box office, but which turned sour when Harry killed Tommy Cullen in the ring. And this was Harry's trainer, he turns and says, and Harry's trainer talks quietly also. 
all the while rhythmic and paced, beating a fist into the brownstone of Stewart's gym and giggling quietly and in between saying Harry was a good boy, real nice boy, no trouble and nobody. He wasn't any trouble, was he, Mr. Stewart? And Mr. Stewart says, go talk to Losey, boy working out upstairs. Go talk to Frank Losey. He knows about Harry. And upstairs, and he told Frank Losey's the boy in purple trunks, middleweight, working without headgear, and told, don't talk to him till the round's called. Frank? What you want, mister? I'm from the police. I want to talk to you about Harry Bryan. We got one minute, mister. You and me. He died today. Did you know that? Everybody here has been talking how he died today. Anything you know about him that... Uh... Used to work out with Harry Bryan. Managed to tell me he's sharpened him up. I did. After a while, I stopped doing that. Why? You have to know, mister. Tell me. Somewhere, something happened to Harry Bryan. Got real mean. Real low. I tell his manager I don't work out with him anymore. When was that? Mm, year and a half, maybe. Maybe a half year before he got around to making Tommy Cullen die. Got so I didn't like that Harry Bryan for nothing. Seen him lately? See him around here sometimes. Try to talk to me sometimes. Seems like he's always trying to find a way to talk to me. About what? That Harry Bryan. You're a real sick man. I know. Sick inside. Something eating on him. Maybe killing that Tommy Cullen boy. Maybe something else. Anyway, he's always trying to talk to me about something else. Asking me about things. About me. How I... About what, Frank? Frank? I'll tell you something, mister. Girl hangs around here most every day. She knows about Harry Ryan. What girl? Girl Lorraine Miller. Comes here most every day. Pays two bits to the till to watch this boy's work. She know more than I do about Harry Bryan, mister. You know where I can find her? Give me her address once. I never went, mister. Got it somewhere in the bottom of my locker. I'll... But it's gone, mister. Yours and mine. You gotta wait till the end of another round. So wait until another three-minute round is done. And during this time, observe the man who presses palm to head and solemnly observes out of the corner of his eye his biceps and how muscular when flexed. Note, too, the boy who tumbles on the mat, turns somersaults, does push-ups all very briskly, and who smiles a secret smile about what he's going to do to that guy come next Saturday night in Jersey. And midway through, the observation and wonder of a boxer who wears glasses... Round ends, and Frankie gestures you over to a locker. Opens it. Finds a piece of paper with Lorraine Miller's address written on. Hands it to you. So leave the abode of sound minds in sound bodies. And go out into the streets again, where people hurry in the heat. Squad car, and find an address. Which turns out to be a hotel for girls only, you're told. And you must wait here in the lobby for Miss Miller. So you do. A few minutes later, Miss Miller seats herself beside you, touches at her collared throat tugs briefly at her skirt, then folds hands in lap and looks up at you with modesty, concern, and embarrassment. At my first call, I should be a policeman. My goodness. I need to ask you some questions about Harry Bryan, Miss Miller. It's pitiful what happened to him. Now that you're here, I'll say it. I've closed my mind to it. Nor will I allow myself even a thought as to what has happened to him when you will have left. How did you happen to know him? I wish you were somebody else, not a policeman. I could talk to you and I could tell you... Start with why you hang around Stewart's gym. I'd hoped that wouldn't happen. What? That I'd be known as the girl who comes there and watches the fighters all the time. But it has happened, hasn't it? I can't help it. Something draws me to that place and I pay my 25 cents and I watch. Now tell me, how is he... Harry Bryan, most of all. I wish I had a drink, a big, tall slug, and please don't repeat it, though they asked me to leave this place. Harry Bryan was something, mister. He was something, that's all. Did you out with him often? As often as he wanted. Where'd you go? Where the booze was. Where there was a place where he could talk about how great he would be again. How it was a great disappointment to his wife. And on his face he would go. Out. And I would help the cabbie lift him into the cab deliver him to Marva. You knew his wife well enough to call her Marva. She introduced me to him. To Jim one day, she saw how interestedly I watched him. She introduced us. I see. Talking like this. Admitting I'd like a tall drink and all. 
Oh, I'm so ashamed. When you will have left, I shall despise myself. Truly. What do you want, Mugman? Oh, and a good, good evening to you, Danny. All right. Uh, what do you want? I've been doing legwork, Danny. Real hot day, and I've been doing legwork. Walking, rechecking things and people. You got something? Uh-huh. Guy with a big motive. Russ Cullen, who had a brother killed by Harry Bryan. Russ? Yeah, Russ, you. Get in here. Hi, Clover. Nice shop you get up there. Thanks. Sit down, Russ. You mean it? Sit down. Now tell the lieutenant what you told me in the interrogation room. We've been together maybe an hour. I talked to you bags and bags of stuff. Which part do you want me to give the lieutenant? You listen to me. I'm tired and it's been a hot day and I've been talking to fresh mouths. It seems like all my life, so you just listen Last to me. Month. One more fresh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we better talk to you when you get over your laughing, Jack, huh, Russ? Come on, we're going down the hall. Oh, you too, Clover. Don't get over eager. I'll talk to all you. All right, talk. The part about Harry Bryan. I guess that's what your fellow wants me to tell you about. That's right. How I ran after Brian like a little punk dog. I followed him around every tank town he fought in. That part, huh? Keep talking to him, Russ. <laughs> yeah. Ever since he killed my brother, I've been doing that. Hopping buses, trains, just so I could be where Harry Bryan was. So you could watch him get his brains beaten in. Is that what you told me, Russ? So I could watch Harry Bryan get his brains beaten in. I never got my fill of it, you know that, fellas? Till a couple of weeks ago in Scranton. What happened there? Brian was a pulp. He was taken but good. Both eyes closed, bleeding from the mouth. You'd have thought I'd die from joy. But you didn't, huh, Russ? No, I didn't, fella. When his fight was over, Brian just sat down in the middle of the ring and bawled like a baby. Nobody could get him out, not even the cops. But you did. Yeah, fella, I did. I took pity on the slob. I got in the ring, told him who I was, said I'd take him to his hotel. He came with me, you imagine? With me, fella. Go on. In his hotel, he wouldn't stop crying. Kept bawling, she won't love me, Russ. She won't love me. Call my wife, Russ. Ask her to come for me. I called her here in New York. Then I walked out on Brian. I guess she came, because next time I heard, he was fished out of the East River. You killed Brian, Russ? Like I told you, fella, here. Why kill what's dead? That what I told you, fella? Go home, Russ. Get out of here. <laughs> Good evening, Mrs. Bryan. May I, uh, come in? Yes. What do you want? How do you feel? That's not what you want to know. Listen, you... What? Listen, you, you better go in there and see for yourself. In there. Well? I'm glad you're here, Mr. Selak. Why? I was worried whether Mrs. Bryan brought your car back. You're still downtown, Selak. Mr. Clover brought me home from the hospital. Funny you should have reminded me about it. Don't matter, Mother. I'll get it. Been here all day, Mr. Selak? Yeah. I ran out for some beer, that was all. And Mother here. What about me? Mother won't eat. You ought to eat, Mother. I keep telling Mrs. you. Mrs. Bryan. What do you want? Have you told Mr. Selak how your husband died? Sweet guy like Harry Bryan. Who wants to hear? I felt him die. Died right under my fingers. Sweet guy like that. You liked him fine, huh, Mr. Selak? Mm -hmm. Used to fill my arena. That's not counting the personal feeling I had for him. How about the personal feeling you have for his wife? <laughs> uh, kick, ain't she? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't blame a fella. <laughs> uh, just a lot of fun. Now, that's what you feel for her. Other feeling, too. You know that, baby. Sure, 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 sure. sure. See? Do you want your husband dead, Mrs. No. B but you didn't love him anymore. No, no, I didn't. Because he changed. Because after he killed that boy in the I ring, I told he... you that. Whatever happened to him happened. He was different. He wasn't the man I married. Yellow. <laughs> the words men use. The quick words. What happened to Harry Brown? I tell you, he turned yellow. No good to himself, no good to you, no good Shut to... Shut up. Yes, sir. I didn't want him anymore, that's all. I told him. He knew. But he fought all the harder to win you back. Didn't punch him. I didn't want him. I couldn't help it. I... You even tried to get him interested in other women. 
How I guess. So I'd have a good, honest reason for leaving him. For him? For Celia? I don't know. So you do. I don't know. But your husband kept coming back, didn't he, Mrs. Bryan? You couldn't get rid of him. He loved me. He shouldn't have loved me. So you got Mr. Sealak to kill him. Sealak. What? You killed Harry, didn't you? You out of your mind? You didn't have to kill him. Kill him? What are you talking about? I've been standing here all afternoon listening to you talk, trying to make up my mind. You look awful. You're crazy. You look awful. You're crazy talking like that. Get him out of here. Listen, you said you wanted him dead, didn't you? Not dead. Not really dead. You said if he was dead. Like you say that about people. Like you say they're better off dead. You don't mean it. You're giving me to him, Marva. Is that what you're doing? I guess so. She's a kick. Ain't she? She tells me she wished he was dead, so I killed him and she was kidding. Beat him over the head with a pipe and she was kidding. Some joke. It's the street of sounds, this Broadway, the echo of footsteps through the summer night, and the far-off trill of a girl's laughter, and rasping of life deep inside the earth, and the other sound, the sighs, the whispered pleas that no one hears. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Martha and Herb Butterfield as Selak. Featured in the cast were Lillian Baeff, Roy Glenn, and Jack Moyles. Bill Anders speaking. Dick Powell, as Richard Diamond, private detective, takes on the Pete Rocco case. He takes the case strictly in self-defense, since Rocco, just out of jail, has vowed to kill Diamond, who originally sent him there. Don't miss a minute of their thrilling battle of wits and weapons on Richard Diamond, private detective, on most of these same CBS radio stations tomorrow night. And remember, for suspense all summer, hear Crime Classics Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network.